Hey, Dave. Hey, Jen. Hey. Wait, Thanks, Ryan. Wow, Wade. Appreciate it. You have been awesome. Hello. <laughs> All right, I'll see you guys later. Thanks again. Thanks, Brian. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending well, on where you're watching us from. Uh, thank you again for joining the Cloud's uh, Executive Summit. And I session. hope you enjoy our previous session with uh, Brian Corey. You have to close up this window. Oh, God, that's in the backstage. All right, sorry, I had some background noise there. Uh, my name is David G. Verani, and I'm the uh, sales leader for North America here at Divi Cloud by Rapid7. And this session, we have a great panel here to discuss achieving and maintaining continuous compliance in the cloud. You know, I have the honor of working with customers across a variety of industries as they work towards their goals of regulatory or corporate compliance. And a running theme amongst all of them is that compliance is a central concern as they accelerate in the cloud. But it takes a tremendous amount of brain power, energy, and time to fulfill these obligations, especially in the ever-changing landscape of the cloud. We heard Corey and Brian talk about some of that. So today, we've assembled an amazing panel, and we'll start with discussing a few reasons why achieving and maintaining continuous compliance in the cloud can be difficult, just to help set the stage. The panel will go over a few of the common pitfalls businesses run into, and finally, they'll share some concrete success strategies from their own experiences. So let's meet our panel. Each of them are leaders in their respective fields. Both Wei and Jennifer have front row seats to the cloud compliance journey. And let's have each of them introduce themselves, starting with Wei from CX Loyalty, a very happy Divi Cloud customer. Wei? Hi, hi everybody. Uh, glad to be here. Thanks for the introduction, David. Um, uh, my name is Wei Dong. I, uh, I'm the global head of applications CX Loyalty. CX Loyalty is a um, SaaS provider for big banks, big telecommunication companies, and a really worldwide footprint to provide the loyalty services. Uh, and we're a SaaS provider, so we're very much uh, cloud native uh, in uh, deploying our solutions to the cloud. Um, just a, a few words about myself. Uh, I started in the telecom domain, uh, you know, working on a lot of the security issues, 2G to 4G. And uh, thank God I'm not in 5G anymore. Uh, so I switched to the quieter side of the course and uh, start to really working on the cloud native solutions. Uh, so very, very glad to be here. And it's good to meet everybody. Thank you, Wei. I appreciate it. Jennifer? Hi there, Jennifer Code, F AWS. I am a technical program manager with AWS, focused, uh, I spend all of my time focusing on governance and uh, compliance and, and security in AWS. So um, been here about a year and a half before joining AWS. I 20 plus years in various operational risk and security roles uh, across major financial services uh, institutions. So I've lived it on the other side and you know wanted to come here and really start formalizing some of the solutions that we offer so that we can support our customers in uh, achieving compliance in the cloud. Great. Thank you, Jennifer. Yeah. All right. So before I begin, I, I do want to mention that due to certain restrictions, we're unable to take audience questions in this particular presentation. But let's get started and, and dive right in. And we'll start with this Gartner snippet from their 2021 Planning Guide for Security and Risk Management. Gartner says, evolving risk, compliance, business, and IT landscapes create new exposures. The COVID-19 pandemic is causing significant disruption and has led to major changes in work from home scenarios and rapid acceleration of digital business initiatives. And beyond just work from home, businesses of many shapes and sizes are trying to engage their internal and external customers in a new and innovative way so they can stay top of mind and compete effectively in their space. We heard Brian and, and Corey talk about this exact topic. Now, I think it's safe to say that anytime you accelerate anything in technology, there's risk. Uh, and Gartner uses a very specific word here, evolving, implying that it's ever changing, which as we know is the, of course, a double-edged sword in the cloud. <clears throat> so to give you some perspective, here are some stats from 2019 from Gartner, pre-pandemic, pre-acceleration that Gartner refers to. 90% of organizations will inappropriately share sensitive data. A majority of enterprises will continue to struggle with measuring cloud security risks. 
99% of cloud security failures will be the customer's fault, meaning that the customer who they themselves are putting up cloud resources into the CSPs, it's, it's their fault. And, and as a reminder, these are stats pre-pandemic, before the pandemic. So despite the platforms and tools available in the marketplace, businesses will struggle with adequately controlling exposure and maintaining client compliance across the uh, ever-changing cloud landscape. But why? And I'll start with Jen here. Jen, you've worked with probably hundreds of customers that have come through your doors. Why does Gartner believe this? Because these are pretty incredible, almost fantastical lines yeah. and stats from Gartner. What, what's your take on this? <laughs> exactly right. Yeah, they're big numbers. And I actually want to you know, touch on that first. Um, whether the number is 90%, some people will look at it and be like, oh, that's way too high. Whether it's 90 or 20, it's still, I mean, it's uh, the data and sensitive data is customer's most important asset. So it is uh, hugely important that this be taken seriously, again, irrespective of the number. But I would say there's a couple things that make it um, particularly challenging. The volume, sheer volume of data has just, uh, and this is 2019, you know, fast forward a year, it's even more so. So one, kind of keeping track of all of your data is just very, very difficult. So let's, you know, kind of do that. The other piece, and, and it was touched on in the last slide, and you mentioned it, um, Dave, is it's evolving. And so the risks and the threats and the threat vectors, this whole space continues to evolve. So you may, you may be, you know, kind of, perfectly protected and, and compliant today, tomorrow there's something new and different. So it is, you know, not that once and done, great, I'm compliant, but it's really more of a, how do I make sure that I'm evolving, I continue to learn, and I make sure that I can, um, you know, leverage tools and others, but it's it's as much about leveraging those tools, but then paying attention uh, to what's you know, what's coming down the pike. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a great point, and and actually, I, I think it's a good segue uh, to the to the one of the questions here. Um, and Wei, I'll, I'll start with you. Why is achieving continuous compliance in the cloud so hard? Then, I mean, you heard Jen, you heard Brian and, and Corey a little bit earlier. Uh, some of those stats, and and for for the audience' sake, you're in many of our audience as position in the executive summit. You're responsible for for cloud compliance. You know, what, what's your take on why achieving continuous compliance in the cloud is so hard? Yeah, I, I just want to start saying from last slide that the CXO is firmly in that 1% of never make a mistake. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> slide. <laughs> so <Okay. laughs> uh, we all know cloud practitioners, security professionals, it, it is really hard to, uh, to do everything right and achieve compliance. Even now, cloud give you another layer of uh, mobility, right? There's uh, great things that come with the cloud. Uh, you know, no, no, no question about it. I heard Brian and uh, Corey talk about the abilities. You know, what you can do in the cloud that you couldn't necessarily do as fast in your on-premise environment, right? Uh, so, just speaking from our own experience as technology, we. Uh, we really had embarked this five-year journey five years ago to now to our workload from an on-premise environment to a cloud. And what we find is there's several things that significantly change from the on-premise environment to the cloud environment. A, um, a big change from a something that you can count on physically there, you can lock it down, you can actually look at the machine itself, to an environment where the agility of inventing as many machines as possible you know, in a day, in, a, in an hour, in a second, but uh, you know, losing the, the direct visibility to your physical environment, right? So the things that you have to think about and partner with your cloud provider, whether it's AWS or whoever that could be, right? It's uh, you know the infrastructure that's changing uh, the fluidity of the infrastructure. The second uh, thing that I found uh, challenging in the cloud compliance is really the a lot of the processes and tools that you saw you have nailed it down in the on-premise environment. You have to rethink about the process. You have to rethink about your tools. Uh, 
the cloud tools are typically different you know, uh, from your on-premise tools. You can bring, shift some on-premise tools to the cloud, of course. Um, but really, you, you, you will find yourself in a position to retool yourself. Um, lastly, I think we're going to talk about that in a later section for this, uh, for this topic is uh, people, right? You know, you you're, you're, you're trained your workforce for years in uh, a compliance you know, science professionals, it's your developers, your DevOps, and everybody that's involved in this picture, right? Now you have to them. You have to hire new people. You know, you have to upscale your existing people. And those are all bringing in additional layers of change in the cloud environment. Yeah, that's great. Jen, I'm going to turn it over to you. Based on the customers that you see, you know, again, walking through your doors, yeah. um, what what do you think even compliance means to them, right? Do they come to you and ask you about compliance, uh, uh, How not just how to achieve it, but what does achieving continuing compliance mean uh, in their cloud journey? Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, no, it's, it's a great question because it, I, I almost feel that continuous compliance, the term is taken on a life of its own. And it's, it's, I kind of see it more as an elusive of, can you ever truly be continuously compliant given the ephemeral nature of the cloud in general? So it's almost like if someone's not, doesn't have a continuous compliance uh, solution, they're feeling like they're missing out or somehow not doing something. Um, but it is, because of that, it is that term. And so it usually comes down to the first uh, thing and way you kind of touched on this as well of compliant with what? Have you rewritten your policies? Do you know what it is, you know, the, the controls that you're going to need to evidence to mitigate the risks, particularly if they are slightly different? And so that um, I spend a lot of time with customers where I'm like, OK, you keep saying compliant, but you may want to be mitigating the risk. And you could be fully compliant, but not mitigating the risk and vice versa. You know, so it's it's really important to you know, take this term for what it is, obviously like getting the um, the right controls in place and Wei mentioned a lot of that, like get that right preventative control so that you know you're compliant then, but have your detective suite as well, knowing that other things are changing. But I think the big thing, and, and when I spend a lot of time with customers is, don't beat yourself up if you don't have continuous. So maybe you are only getting alerted uh, every hour or at the end of every day or looking at things. Is that continuous? Mm -hmm. But I, I do think that there's an expectation of you will know um, at every instant. And certainly there are great tools out there to do that. But it's making sure you cut through what are the data elements specifically you're looking for on what's going to move the needle. But I also um, you know, want to reinforce, really look at what your policies are. Because, you know, again, you don't want to be compliant with a policy that in this new environment may no longer be mitigating your risk or addressing the issue. And that can be uncomfortable. And that gets back to Wei's point of the people part of this. So it can be a big mind shift to say, OK, this is how I used to have it. And it, they may even have forgotten of what on prem. I knew how I was evidencing it, but I might have forgotten of what is it I was trying to do. Um, so I think that that's an important piece. Yeah, it's a great segue uh, to the next topic, right? What are the pitfalls? That's a great point. Uh, Way, you know, again, you're a real world practitioner here. Uh, what are some of the lessons that you've uh, learned here or, or perhaps the pitfalls that you're going to suggest to your peers that they avoid while trying to achieve continuous compliance? Yeah, so there's, uh, yeah, there's so many, right? There's uh, a lot of challenges when you move your workload to the cloud. Uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's always in the environment also. The current life going with your existing on-premise solutions, now you're moving to the cloud, right? Um, some of the things that I think Jen touched on uh, where uh, we're discussing is really make sure that if you want to Get your policies aligned with your tooling. Tooling, uh, you know, in this case, are largely in several categories, right? We have your detective monitoring kind of tooling as a foundation for everything that you would do. Uh, on top of that, you would build your um, um, preventative tooling. Those are large guardrails, right? 
one of the things that you really want to watch out for is you know, while you have the monitoring toolings as your foundation, your preventative toolings can, you really have to adjust the scope and decide on how much, how wide or how narrow you want to give it to, right? So to your developers, to your product teams, to your professional teams that are actually making money for your company, right? Uh, so the large guardrail that you, you said there are very macro level guardrails, right? These are the things that you don't want them to do because you know, as soon as you go outside that boundary, you're, in you're not compliant and you, you know, frankly, introduce security risks, right? But you don't want to narrow it down too much also because then you are really choking your development, your innovation, and in the end, you know, compliance doesn't make money. The company product will make you the money, right? So we, we all make our paycheck. We love our paychecks. Uh, so that's where the preventive tooling has to be down, up and down, you know, from your risk levels, from your organization's risk tolerance, and also from your experience on um, what are the attack vectors could come from, where, you know, you really need to tighten it up. And then uh, another thing I find personally with AWS and DB Cloud experience, which we are, we're, we're happy customers for both, uh, is that uh, on top of your preventative toolings, you have to run automation with a continuous um, corrective uh, toolings as well, right? The, the beauty of automation and corrective tooling on top of tooling is while your guard wheels can be large and wide, you actually can have some narrow, fine-tuned corrections to the um, cloud environment, to the workload, or to the things that you know you want to deploy into your AWS, right? So that's that's where you can get as granular as you want with a tool like DB Cloud, with automation, with the box. Uh, and and once I find that there's a boundary and there's a, a, uh, a balance you can strike, now you're in a happier place for continuing to comply. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. What's I think transition to some of the strategies that you have seen in your real world experiences, both of you. Um, uh, you know, again to bring up <clears throat> this great Gartner quote, right? Evolve. They use the word evolve again. Uh, their recommendation for this in this planning guide: evolve infrastructure security to cover multi-cloud architectures and leverage automation, right? Something that you just you just touched on. I thought it was a good segue. Um, <clears throat> so you know, let's start with Way again. Um, what are some of the levers to strike the right balance? If I if I captured it correctly here, it sounds like there's there's certainly preventative, then there's certainly proactive, uh, corrective, and then uh, uh, automation. I don't want to put words in your mouth here. Do I have the right levers there? Are there other ones? And and what is the right balance to continue to create that continuous compliance? Yeah. So 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 it's it's uh, it's always a, a fine tuned process, right? So we uh, in AWS environment, uh, which we are we're a major customer in, right? We find is that uh, from a, from the monitoring perspective, right, which is the foundation for everything, uh, we uh, you know we heavily leverage uh, what uh, DB Cloud can provide, right, into where we have and uh, what's changing, what we have today at this hour versus you know what we've had uh, yesterday, right. So that's that's where you know is uh, is we lay out the, the certain foundations. And then with AWS, uh, it gives us really the great toolings uh, for setting up guardrails. One of the major ones, as I'm sure everybody on this call will, will be aware of, is uh, SAPs, right, your service control policies. Uh, that's, that's a great set of tools that can help you to really set that stage and make sure that you play, uh, you create a safe, compliant playground for your teams to really you know, excel and innovate. Uh, and, then, uh, and then the corrective controls that we can put on top of automation is TV Cloud bots or some uh, automation you build in-house or automations we build on top of uh, uh, all those serverless lambdas, all those kind of utilities that could give uh, us additional um, controls and levers to pull, right? Uh, what I really find myself is there's 
there's not there's really not enough hours you can have. You know, there's not enough work in the day, uh, in the week, in the year that you, you can do with all these practices. You just constantly have to tune them and and, and you learn from your mistakes, uh, to, be, to be frank, right? Whenever you find something, you adjust it and you have the right balance again and cue something else happens that it's out of balance, so you need to. That's very helpful. So I just wanna make sure I capture this detection prevention, correction, and then automation, maybe is that, if that's the, the kind of that, uh, mm -hmm. <clears throat> that journey. And maybe that's what they mean by, again, this evolve concept, right? Every organization might be different, but um, there's a crawl, walk, run model. Uh, Jen, I'll turn it over to you. You know, uh, what do you think the levers are to strike the right balance? Or do you have any response to what, what Wei just said? Yeah, I, I really like how, how Wei laid that out, especially talking about the individual technology teams. And it almost goes back to the to the pitfalls we were talking about before. And I think a lot of this is um, almost democratizing a lot of this uh, responsibility. Um, you need to get everybody involved. And there can be that pitfall of, you know, I'm the, I'm the one who's the expert. I need to make all the decisions. And you've got to remember the levers are going to be the more people that are empowered sharing that accountability and then relying on some of the, um, you know, corrective actions or, you know, training on the back of um, detect, but being very transparent with what controls are in place and why um, and really building that, um, that, that environment, that collaborative environment so that it, it's not an us and them. And, and that's really important. And I've, uh, seen that go wrong so many times. And it usually with the best intentions of, oh, you know, those engineers, they always make the same mistake. But then at the same time, it's like, okay, well, did you explain to them and do they understand why? And, you know, did you share the details of that actual breach? I mean, at some point there needs to be um, that, you know, kind of shared experience. And so I, I would say one of the most important levers is just kind of balancing that responsibility and moving to where you can a trust but verify and stay on top of it so you can get the evolution, but that's how you scale. Yeah, actually it's a great point. Brian had brought that up as well. Education being an important part of what his mandate was with, with him and Chris and Divi Cloud. Um, I wonder, way does, does culture play into this, right? You know, based on what Jen said, and again, based on your own experiences, uh, does, your, does your security culture, your organization culture have an influence here? Yeah, it has uh, it has huge. It made a huge difference, right? So, so you know, if you think about traditional IT security, you know, think about a guard with a gun, with a badge, you know, standing in front of a room that's closed and locked, right? That's a uh, you know, that's that, that's no longer the model, obviously, uh, from where the reality is in AWS and any kind of cloud environment. Uh, so. What we found is uh, really subscribe to the culture of uh, DevSecOps, to subscribe to the culture of security is everybody's responsibility, starting from the day that you decided there is a requirement from your customer to implement some kind of feature, right? Um, to implement uh, really uh, secure SDLC, championed you know, about 10 years ago by Microsoft, but uh, now it's widely practiced from different companies, uh, doing all the security controls, not just at back end on the security side, but really shift to the left uh, to make your um, product managers, your developers, your DevOps people, your QA, everybody in the Agile team to become your security engineers, right? Um, what really transformed our security culture also is uh, what we call the security champion program. I'm sure a lot of you have heard about those. Uh, that's uh, basically making sure that you have uh, somebody identified in every that's actually responsible for security for compliance. When they develop a feature, somebody will raise their hand and say, hey, you know, we're adding another PI data uh, in, into our database. You know, should we you know, think about how to uh, make sure we update the, the a repository uh, so that we're complying with uh, GD GDPR or whatever regulation right, that you need to do. So a lot of culture changes, you know, the kind of from a traditional security is the security guy's job 
and the security guy's job is to hurt everybody so that nobody can move, so that I can, I'll be secure. Um, to something like everybody's moving at a faster speed, but everybody's responsible for security, and you really shift the whole security posture to the left hand side of the software development. Yeah, that's great. Jen, any any follow up to that about culture? Yeah, I mean, the one piece that I want to highlight, and, I, and I've seen this um, be a challenge uh, for some of our customers, is if the culture is one of blame. So it's a, so let's imagine um, unencrypted data ends up in the cloud. How do you deal with it? Do you, you know, does it, is it do you blame the engineer? Do you blame the security guy? Or, you know, I mean, again, can you get comfortable with the security folks, you know, kind of sharing in the accountability? Or are they going to be the ones, you know, answering the question of, well, what happened? You know, what didn't you do? So I, I, that's a, it's a tough shift to make. Um, but making sure that there is a learning from any uh, issues and incidents. Um, you know, obviously there's some element of if it, if there was malice or kind of other, um, but there there needs to be an environment where, uh, you know, individuals are not, you know, scared for their jobs or, um, you know, kind of not comfortable asking for help, thinking that, you know, there's something else of, oh, well, gee, if you don't know, like, you know what's going on. So that's an important one. And it's interesting because I often find that um, customers don't even realize that that's what the uh, that that's what the issue is. I get um, I, I advise a lot of customers on service assessments and and hey, can I use this service? Is it safe to use? Um, with the usual follow up of well, you know, my security guys are taking so much time. So I ask what I think is an innocent question of well, if it went wrong, like is that the poor guy that's going to get fired? Like you're incenting the behavior to basically take zero risk. So it's, you know, making sure that that is up front and getting that balance because, you know, you want people to experiment, but you want them to own the responsibility um, and, you know, not uh, not say, well, it's not my fault. He told me it was okay. So it, it, That's a great point. And actually, it, you know, it's a, again, a perfect segue. Uh, there's, a, you know, talked about this earlier in the last section about how talent plays such an important part in achieving continuous compliance, um, you know, or a talent gap, right? That can play a significant portion, uh, uh, have a significant impact. Uh, way again, again, you're you're in the driver's seat, like many of our audience members. How does talent or a talent gap play into achieving continuous compliance? Yeah, there's uh, there's definitely a, a, a talent that exists in. It's our security organization, right? Uh, it's getting better. We're we're retooling. We're we're improving our patterns. Uh, but the you know, first one to admit that my organization is not very good. okay. So I I find two major uh, challenges. This uh, just from a talent, uh, just pure skill perspective, right? One is you know how do you shift from on-premise set of skills to the cloud set. And it's, uh, it's hugely different between you know what I can do on premise. Uh, you know, even even engineers that's great at automation on premise could be struggling in cloud because there's a new set of vocabularies they have to learn. There's a new set of tools they have to train themselves for, and and you really have to you know look to the engineers that really like to upskill themselves, be really eager to learn in order to be successful in this kind of environment. Uh, the other Gap I find, uh, you know, uh, fundamentally, uh, the security professionals' um, uh, definitions or their skill background is evolving as well. Right? I personally came from a development background, architect, uh, you know, developing enterprise uh, telecom grade software, uh, those kind of things. Uh, so uh, for me personally, it, it makes me feel comfortable moving into an environment where security as a compliance as a code, right? How do you codify your compliance in the code, uh, you know, in, in your problems, something that actually can reflect in the line of script or in the line of code. And so have the evidence being logged in the log so they can just put it on your fingertips. 
and and no longer struggle with you know what I do with the auditor model, right? Or you know no longer struggle with uh, last night some Indian engineer did something uh, for us in the production environment, right? So that's that's the deal. That's the thing you have to deal with: is cloud, with modern applications, with microservices, with all the all the things that we need to deal with with containers, right? All this kind of crystallize into a new set of skill set. People that not free to read the lines of code, uh, you know, really embracing the opportunity to codify your security, codify your compliance in your environment, and and that, you know. That could be quite different from your traditional admin, you know, the type of you know security professionals, and shifted more toward a a, a part of a, a DevSecOps and development kind of skill set. Yeah, uh, Jen, I'll turn it over to you. But I thought it was a great point that you brought up with the um, uh, that example with the engineer or security professional that may be getting fired based on what Wei just said, and I think your own point though. Security is everyone's responsibility, but at the same time, you need to hold people accountable. Right? How how do, how do you balance that when it comes to your talent pool? Yeah, no, I mean it's it's not an easy thing. I mean, so that's where the expectations need to be set up front on on what things are. I mean, obviously there are, uh, and this is can be the way that you set up your control environment as well. Uh, back to uh, Way's point of let's make sure that we have we move things. We're shifting left. Um, and building it in. Well, if you have a fast track for the teams that are um, following all of the rules and uh, have consistently low risk and you know other pieces, and then maybe have another hurdle or two, a team that uh, you know might have had a an incident or an outage or you know other. Um, so just not out of punishment, but out of like protection. So you can end up having a differentiated. Um, environment to almost like a fast track for some things and then just to double check uh, for others. So that's one thing of sharing the accountability and making sure because you don't want to like kind of slow down everybody when it either not out, not all the systems are as risky, um, which is one thing. So you maybe need a different um, layered control set. The other piece I wanted to emphasize and, and um, way started touching on this Continuous compliance is more than just security. And so there's a talent gap in risk and control professionals in general and really thinking through um, other of the controls. So even things like your change management controls or you know some of the other things where you're saying, okay, so am I uh, enforcing automated deployment only, which obviously has uh, security considerations, but it also, uh, you know, has other kind of availability considerations. So I think there's an important piece of, um, one, acknowledging that this move to the cloud absolutely has significant security uh, implications, but pretty much all of your uh, risk and control across all three lines of defense um, will have, will need to have that change and that continuous compliance policies may need to be rewritten. More people need to get really comfortable when technically savvy where maybe they didn't before. Even the way the environment is audited really, you know, takes a, will change a bit. So I think it's important to really look at the talent gap, which is, you know, very uh, significant in security. It'll impact the broader areas of risk and control as well. So, so staying on that same vein, Wei brought up guardrails. Jen, uh, based on the customers that you see going through your doors, where you work with a lot of different folks across uh, a variety of industries, uh, uh, guardrails, what is the impact, the tangible impact that guardrails would have uh, or do have in, in the customers that you see? Yeah. I mean, it allows, I mean, guardrails are what they are. They allow you to go a little faster because if you go off the road, you won't go all the way off the road. So I, it is um, exactly where you want to be, but it does slow you down. Now, some of the slowdown you want to absolutely happen, uh, you know, I mean, again, it's, we have a term um, that we call undifferentiated heavy lifting. A lot of the guardrails are in place to make it easier for your engineers to not worry about some of the basic networking controls or some of the availability controls. So we put in guardrails to make sure uh, that those things are in place so that they can focus on 
feature functionality um, as it goes in. So it's getting that balance of, hey, let's let's do some of that heavy lifting so that I am confident that I have locked down my public access, that I'm turning encryption on by default so that somebody doesn't need to remember. Because there is that assumption that, well, if it was important, I thought you would have taken care of it for me, um, which was a big part of on-prem of, well, if you didn't want me to do that, why do I have access to it? So it's so that's where we see see the guardrails, but they're hard. And so I think the biggest thing that, and actually I would love Way's um, response to this one, but the biggest thing I see customers struggling with is when is enough enough? You know, so it's a, I got some stuff, I'm detecting it, but, oh, is that enough? And can I get comfortable going? So it's, it's almost like it's a, tell me when it's good enough. What have other customers done? I hear that a lot, which kind of implies to me, uh, I'm not comfortable that I'm doing enough. Can you just tell me? Um, so way, I don't know if you've struggled with that, but that's uh, that's something that I know I hear that I'm sure the audience would be like, how about that enough? <laughs> tell me. Yeah, way, go ahead. Yeah, so, so definitely that's a, that's a very common theme. Right? Uh, you know, I, and uh, you, you constantly struggle with what you know, what you don't know, uh, what is good, what is not good. Questions, you know, as security professionals, we have to deal with. Uh, so one thing really resonated with me, Jen, that was, that was uh, you know, to, to, to be really secure and compliant, to really do that in a fast-changing environment that we are in today, uh, with all the demands, uh, you know, from your clients, from your CEOs, from everybody that's around you, right? As security professionals, um, we seem to be always be the bad guy, right? We are slowing everybody down. We're doing the doing the right things, but at the moment, the right reason. So uh, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of juggling you know, as security professional. We have to do every day. Uh, but what I find is, you know, to your point, Jen, if you make security easier. Process. You know, make things easier for people to do the right thing. Make it easy for people to do the right thing, right? You never, you know, are going to unplug that remote out of, uh, you know, the hands of uh, watch TV every day until, you know, you find a better remote or you make it, you know, change TV channels with blink of an eye, right? If, if you can do that, he's not going to um, unplug that remote anymore, right? So. You know, doing things more secure, more compliant is more about how do I enable my people? How do I enable everybody in this ecosystem to do the right things easier? And that's why we actually changed the names of our security teams. You know, uh, you know we're part of a, a, a tribe. We're, we're a fully agile tribe, right? So our security squad is in a tribe called Enable Tribe. Uh, so we're hand in hand with our DevOps engineers, with our application engineers, we're enabling them to do the right things, enabling them to develop security into their code, into their software, in develop compliance from day one, from get-go, so that everybody's job is easier. And also, it's faster also, because we build all this automation to make sure that they can do faster things with click of a button, you know, uh, instead of and uh, you know all the policies and regulations and read through them trying to comply. Yeah, it's a great point, right? And uh, automation sounds like it's a running theme. Uh, I want to go back to the topic that you had mentioned. The correction is is the compliance, right? The detection is part of it, but it's the correction that actually keeps you compliant. Um, and it sounded like, based on what you just said, automation is uh, one of the key areas that will help with that talent gap. So uh, uh, why don't more companies take advantage of automation? Right? You know, if, if, if automation sounds like it's extraordinarily important, um, what's the struggle there? Uh, you know, maybe, you know, talk, share about your own experiences. Way, can we start with you? You know, how did you get to that run stage in the crawl walk run? Um, yeah, and, and yeah. I really like your, your crop, uh, walk and run model. Right, so automation is great until you can prove it's great. Right, you know, there's always the show me uh, face that. You have, right, so uh, you know, yeah, we talk about the, the pool of people that we need to assemble, right, in order to actually develop automation, right, and and 
And these are the same pool of people they're going to compete with to become product features all of a sudden, right? Because security is no longer uh, somebody, somebody on the side. It's part of the team. It's, you know, inside there is taking your main hours, you know, it's taking your, uh, your story points away from the agile teams, right? So, um, uh, so, that's, so that's one thing that you, you really have to uh, deal with and, uh, and uh, convince people, right? It's really safe time and money, right, uh, in the long run. And also, you know, you, you, would you rather spend this money at the beginning of the project to be compliant, or you would delay your project for six months and spend $100 million more to be compliant, right? So that's, that's, uh, that's where you have to have that conversation with people and really teach them. What we also find is that, um, you know, evidence and metrics-based, um, you know, uh, Proving to your executive teams, to uh, the leadership in your engineering, uh, is really important, right? Uh, and also from that crawl walk uh, strategy that we talked about, um, you know, maybe you start with notifications, right? Don't try to automatically correct the, the mistake. That's why they make a mistake. You know, give them a chance to correct themselves first. Unless they feel comfortable with your automation on the notification, now you can tell to them, hey, you know, instead of you have to, you know, get up in the middle of the you know, two, maybe what we can do is to help you to write this script to make it automatically change, you know, so that you don't no longer don't have to, you know, change that EC2 instance anymore. Right. So that's that's the conversation you want to have and and get them comfortable with your um, the things you can do now to um, choose the right direction, and eventually you find that people are great people. They want to this. You know, they they see yeah. this benefit. They want to develop things in the right way. And they, they they're going to be successful. They're going to be most results. Great, Jen. Any uh, uh, any uh, thoughts here on the customers that you see about automation? Yeah, it's kind of. I would love for there to be a big red easy button of like press here and you'll be compliant. Um, so the thing is, is that most of the customers that I deal with are leveraging automation, but there's so much required. <laughs> so I don't want to understate the the complexity if it were so easy. And I have had, um, you know, a lot of people just like, can't you just give me, you know, that big red easy button and just like, I'm done, everything's automated. Um, so it, we do find, uh, all of our customers, all of AWS, um, you know, we're obviously a company of builders. We all want to, uh, you know, be able to automate things away. And it, it's unfortunately not quite that easy. Um, but I think as we do make it easier, I do think customers will continue to really take advantage of it. Great. Excellent. Well, Wei and, and Jen, we're just about to hit time. I want to thank you both for your contributions and spending your morning with us. I really appreciate it. I hope the audience uh, got some great insights from these two experts. Uh, thank you again for, for joining. Great. Thank you. All right. Uh, next up, we have Anthony Johnson. Uh, uh, navigating a career to go from a hands-on practitioner to an executive leader requires the same three characteristics uh, needed for an organization to transform through a technology solution. So let's hear Anthony as he discusses those traits and how they can be harnessed to accelerate a transformation at scale. Anthony Johnson, take it away. And thank you everyone for joining this session.